What the hell? Aloha nerds and welcome back to the Sal Wogs White's Great Gut Reaction where I watch things and react from the gut. Today I'm doing a supplemental episode, a sort of bonus discussing Terminator 2. In the previous episode, which was filmed about a year and a half ago, I've been very busy and distracted in the making of many of my videos, so you'll notice my weight fluctuate and my hair change a lot. Uh, but in that video, I talk about how Terminator 2 is better than Terminator 1, and I'm still right. But I want to specifically talk about action movies, storytelling through action. This is a sort of offshoot of what I'm already doing with why it's great gut reaction. Action movies, storytelling through action. I discussed in the previous episode how just because it's packaged as an action movie does not mean there isn't storytelling involved. Uh, so I just want to get into a little bit of what that means. So. You can watch the other video, I basically go through the whole plot. But for the beginning of this movie, Terminator 2, how does action tell the story? How, 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 is, what, how is that supposed to make sense? The beginning of the movie starts off with the future war, endoskeletons are crushing human skulls. I mean, are we clear? Is that not already a very clear image of just, we're just seeing action? Future war, endoskeletons that are made of metal, shooting at humans. Okay, we're just seeing things and we can already tell what's going on. Yes, there's a voiceover from Linda Hamilton sort of giving us the context, but the visual storytelling is already there. After seeing all the carnage waged between man and machine, we get... Of course. <laughs> After seeing the carnage waged between man and machine in the final battles of the future post-apocalyptic war, we see a... Whew, I'm sweating. We see a group of soldiers in a sort of uh, a ruined bunker-ish hallway there's a whole army of soldiers, and one man starts walking between them. And as he's walking between them, every single soldier stops and salutes. Every single one. Now, we, we might be familiar with this as this is how you're supposed to behave in the mil military. But this scene, by their physical actions, demonstrates that every single one of these soldiers has the utmost respect for this general. Every single one. And the general is... Older John Connor in 2029, fighting the final battle between man and machine. And they're winning. They are winning this battle. But that is all that respect. It's unspoken in this movie. It's explained in the first movie that John Connor is the one who carries mankind to the final days in the, the, the victory of man over machine. That is how important he is to these people. But you also understand there's a respect that he's saved their lives. But all of that is done visually. We just visually get the essence of that respect by every single soldier standing attention when he passes by. So that's just one form of storytelling through action. It's not even a fight, right? But that's just physical actions that characters are performing that defines the relationships between each other. Now let's go into the first action scene. When our first two Terminators meet, we have Arnold in his leather biker outfit carrying around roses, and we got T-1000 showing up in the police uniform. And uh, the way the story is unfolding, we don't know which one's the bad guy. They could both be bad guys. We don't really know what's going on yet. 
as the story is unfolding. And when John Connor gets caught between them in the hallway of the mall, and Arnold draws his shotgun, but just seeing Arnold, John Connor knows. He already knows from the photos, from the news, that, you know, oh, that's a, that's a bad guy. Let's get the heck away from that dude. Uh, he, he, initially, John's running from a cop. So John runs from the Terminator, almost runs straight into the T-1000, but when the Terminator draws his shotgun from the flower, from the flower case, he says, get down. So right off the bat, okay, we get a little line of dialogue. John Connor ducks, and that's when the shooting ensues, and then Terminator, without wasting a beat, steps in front of John Connor and takes all the bullets from the T-1000. So this physical action, this action sequence has a consequence. It's not just about, ooh, cool, shoot him up. We're establishing the antagonism between the hero and the villain. It's the Terminator and the T-1000 establishing their relationship, establishing their power, which one is stronger than the other. Physically, they about have the same amount of strength. But the T-1000 is just a little bit quicker. He's a little bit, he's a little bit stronger, a little bit quicker. And most importantly, he's made of liquid metal. But even more importantly than that, we establish the relationship that the Terminator T T-800 Arnold Schwarzenegger is here to protect John Connor. That's what this action scene establishes. And, you know, John's still running from him, but once Terminator rescues him from the canal chase, the famous canal chase with that amazing, uh, with so many great stunts, but in particular, the, uh, the semi truck driving over the side and crashing onto the ground. It's basically the Optimus Prime semi, but in all black. And then Terminator himself doing the incredible jump off of the ramp landing into the canal. And then in the incredible explosion uh, once Terminator saves him from the canal chase, that's when John understands, oh, he, he is here to rescue me. It does take a bit of that running and being afraid and, and, and physical action to prove to the other character, because that's the stakes of this show, that's the rules of the show. Physical action is required to prove to John that, okay, this guy's here to look out for him. And that's what the very next scene is about when they pull off to a little alleyway and John just tries to lay all the snakes straight. Okay, you're obviously not here to hurt me. I get that. And that's, see, each action scene, whether it's just saluting or whether it's an actual shootout, is about establishing relationships, establishing character, and that those establishments are what we use as an audience to both feel and understand what's going on with the character. You know, this is very much the same thing in Star Wars. Every action sequence brought the characters together. When, uh, after Obi-Wan dies, and Luke, Han, and Leia escape the, the Death Star, they get an incredible harrowing action sequence where they're in space fighting the, uh, uh, fighting the TIE Fighters. And that's something that brings them together. The sequences bring them together. They are not separated randomly just for dramatic sake. Every action sequence is about bringing the characters together. Moving forward, when we meet Sarah Connor and she is inside the mental institution, we see a sequence where she's laying down, strapped to the bed, supposedly sedated, and the guard who's supposed to be checking on her does this creepy lick of her face. Now the fact that he does that and the fact that she doesn't react, that's an action, right? No words. That communicates to you their relationship as well. He's a guard who abuses his power. He's very creepy. The fact that she doesn't react, there's some kind of history behind this. And it's in a deleted scene that the guards are beating her up to make sure she takes her sedatives. And it's also earlier in the movie established that she is very violent with everyone. We don't know exactly how much this circle comes starts with one person or the other, but clearly this is a relationship where the guards are creepy and abusive. When Sarah Connor breaks out, she has this incredible sequence of taking down the various guards and her therapist. And, uh, you know, all of this is 
a testament to how she has spent the last, again, character history, she's spent the last 10 years, give or take, since John was conceived, since Kyle Reese died in the first movie. She spent all this time training uh, with soldiers, with mercs, whoever she could learn from in order to survive and also teach her son how to be a military survivor and leader. So all of this is being expressed through her action. That's part of it. It's just it's character as well as action. And Linda Hamilton worked out like a beast and was, uh, by Arnold's own complaint, by Arnold Schwarzenegger's own complaint, Linda, Ham Linda Hamilton was more ripped than him during the filmmaking of Terminator 2. Uh, but during this scene, okay, she basically gets away from everyone and gets to the elevator, but when she gets to the elevator, who comes out of the elevator but the Terminator himself, followed by John Connor, but she sees Terminator. This is a classic scene, at least in my eyes, when she sees the Terminator and we get this dreary slow motion sequence. Uh, James Cameron only uses slow motion for apprehension, for tension building. And when she sees Terminator, it's very much like when we see Terminator for the first time in the first movie. Everything goes slow, but you see her terror. Up until this point, she hasn't been scared of anyone. She fears nobody, but she is still scared of the Terminator. And she just immediately runs from him. And her terror is so real and raw that all of her badassness completely goes away. That's how scared and how much of an impact this character has on her. So again, it's action, it's running around, it's screaming, but it's communicating to you the state of mind the character is in. And not only that, when the Terminator rescues her and it becomes the trio for the rest of the movie, she has this antagonistic relationship. So her absolute terror of the Terminator is necessary to establish her discomfort with suddenly now working with the Terminator. You know, you can't just expect the character just to be comfortable working with someone that was completely against them or trying to kill them in a previous storyline. And that's what's going on for the whole rest of the movie. It's part of her arc. Part of her arc is not just uh, warming up and becoming a, a comforting mother to her son, but it's also overcoming this trauma that the Terminator has has put upon her. In addition, there is a deleted scene in which the original version of the movie has a scene where the Terminator explains that Terminators are, are sent out without the ability to learn so that they just complete their missions and don't think too much, even though they're, uh, they're from the AI. So it just shows you even the AI has sort of a, uh, a very similar rules as human beings. It has its own fears and limitations. Uh, and so there's a deleted scene, which is really cool, really technically uh, savvy and, and cool from everyone's point of view, from everyone's side, involving Linda Hamilton's own twin sister uh, doing a mirror gag where they're actually surgically opening up uh, the Terminator's head and pulling out the microchip, the very microchip uh, from the first Terminator that starts the whole plot of this movie with Miles Dyson. This is the thing Miles is studying. But they pull out the chip and Sarah Connor takes the opportunity to attempt to smash that chip to prevent the Terminator from being a problem for the rest of the movie. Uh, but ironically, they're trying to help it learn so that it can also be less of a problem for the rest of the movie. Now I talk about this in the episode that this is supplementing. James Cameron in his interviews talks about leadership is an innate thing that lives within you. This deleted scene also establishes John Connor's leadership ability and what his leadership could potentially look like when he catches Sarah about to smash the Terminator's microchip and he stops her. And she yells at him saying, you don't know what these things are capable of. We have to take care of them now while we still can. And he says, if I'm supposed to be the leader of the human race, why don't you try listening to me for once? And uh, it's a moment where she actually has to concede to him because he's right. They really have only survived this far because of the Terminator. 
and there's no way they're going to be able to fight off the T-1000 without him. So it's just a moment where she has to concede. But from this moment on, she barely talks to John Connor. Now, the way this movie plays, you know, without this scene, it just seems like Sarah Connor's purely cut off emotionally. But with this scene really motivates why she's kind of ignoring John and she's just protecting him, but not really because she is personally offended that her own son wants to protect the very thing that tried to kill her and him, essentially, before he was born. So she's got a lot of baggage going on, but the action scene where she's seeing him and it's dreamlike terror, all of that is there to establish that, the, that deep character agony that's going on. And without the power of that, there's no power when we reach the finale and she overcomes that trauma and shakes the Terminator's hand. That's just not going to happen. So every single piece of the story is so important that uh, the action scene has to have a consequence. Not just... Uh, uh, God, action movies today are so ter terrible where all it is is that it's basically a chase where the bad guy escapes. It's so lame. Every action scene, no matter whether or not characters survive, has to affect the rest of the story. It's not just about, oh, we lose a character so that we have a dramatic emotion. It's really about how does that loss or how does, how does this new player in the game affect the rest of the story and affect the characters for the rest of the story. In this case, the Terminator's return is, is, is an absolute direct antagonism to Sarah Connor's psyche because this is this is the only thing she's truly afraid of the future and the thing that tried to kill her coming back again the thing that killed the man she fell in love with that that gave her her son so all of that is happening and it's, it's so crucial that even though she's in this big action scene we do stop for a, a sort of slow-mo terror that then builds ramps back up to more action and the T-1000 shows up but all of these things are about establishing and building the relationships uh, that's so important toward making a good film. So, yeah. And I already bring up in the previous video the Miles Dyson shootout when Sarah Connor tries to destroy Miles Dyson's house. On the surface, this could be seen as an action scene or a horror scene, but it's really about establishing how far gone Sarah Connor is as a character and when she finally decides not to draw her weapon, not to pull the trigger, that is a consequence to the character. That's a consequence to the story that shifts the way the rest of the story moves. This is what sc good screenwriting is about, good direction is about, good acting is about. Every single level has to tell the story and support the arc that is going on in the movie. So uh, I don't really think I need to say more than that. I, I just, I wish I had, kind of had this in mind when I made the video. This is just a sort of supplementary action movie, storytelling through action. Uh, this is for my little offshoot. I'll be doing this occasionally for action movies when I'm, I'm talking about them. I have already kind of done it a little bit for the movie The One, uh, which is an okay review, but you, know, you can go back and check that out. And it's an okay movie, so the review matches the movie. Uh, but that's essentially what I had to say, just a little supplementary information. I just want you as filmmakers, you know, this review show is not really just for regular people. This is for filmmakers and artists. As filmmakers, you should be looking for these things. What's going on with the story? The action is not just blatant action. If you're a filmmaker, if you're a film student, and that's what you think about action, I'm sorry, you've poorly trained yourself, you haven't been paying attention to your teachers, or you have bad teachers. You need to be looking at a movie. The genre does not matter. The genre simply means the rules and the ways in which the story is communicated change. And I already discussed that in the uh, initial video, again, shot a year and a half ago, miraculously with a very similar haircut. But anyway, I just wanted to get through a little bit of that. I thought that's very important to establish that today we just waste too much time making dialogue do all the work. We don't. We don't, have, we don't trust our actors, we don't trust ourselves as storytellers. We are literally about to make AI do all the work for us, which is what is the point of doing that 
when it's people who are supposed to tell stories about people. That is the whole point of filmmaking is that people are telling stories about people and, and that's how this whole market works. So I don't get what is up with you studio people. I get you wanted to save money, but what the fuck? You make no sense at all. I mean, thank God for YouTube. I hope YouTube doesn't get any closer to the studio system because that, this is just makes no sense at all. You have no interest in the business that you're interested in. You just want to suck all the money out. You might as well call yourselves not shareholders. You're just little vacuum cleaners with people attached to them. But thank you. I hope that doesn't cost me a job in the future. But it's very important that you understand that that's what you're doing. That, and you as artists, you need to understand that this is what we're fighting for. That I stand with SAG-AFTRA and the, 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 writing, uh, and the writers. All of that. I stand with it because we are here to tell stories about people. And uh, not to say that a machine and an AI can't have stories to tell, but if you're trying to get a machine to replicate a life experience, that's just not going to happen. We're here to talk about what goes on with us as people. And every spit of storytelling through action, and again, the, the core video, the, I, I suggest watching that. I do think it's a good podcast about Terminator 2, T-1000% better than the original. <laughs> Everything I talk about in that movie, it's, if you watch this, it's to supplement what I'm talking about there. So I would recommend go back to watch that. What I'm talking about here is absolutely related to all the story arcs and characters and humanisms uh, and human stories that are, are what we're here to tell. So thank you very much for listening and aloha. <laughs> I don't know why I laughed. Ah, don't judge me. I just give flesh wounds. I made to terminate, but John said not no more, mate. What was I built for? What was I built for? Taking a life, I was the ideal. Looked so human, turns out that I'm steel. I used to infiltrate, now I can't find a date, cause I, 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 am just some robot you hacked, what was I built for? I can't cry, it's something I can never do, but I want to try. What was I built for? What was I built for? Come with me if you want to live. I swear I will not kill anyone. I will not kill anyone. What was I built for? What was I built for? Ba da 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 na 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 ba da 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 na 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 ba da 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 na 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 na